This is a video review for Earth Materials and Systems. It's designed to help students pass a content assessment for a summit platform in middle school. Uh, it can be useful for other students as well. If you want to know what I'm talking about, just look at the description and you'll see more details in what I am describing in this video. But this is a quicker review. Uh, I have a different series of videos that goes into detail on each of the objectives, and I encourage you to watch that if you're still learning about this at first. But this could be the video that you need if you just need something, a last push before you pass the test. So the first objective for this was describing the different spheres that make up the Earth's materials and organisms. And we talked about the geosphere, which is like the rock part of the Earth, and the atmosphere, which is the gaseous part of the Earth. The hydrosphere, which is the water part of the Earth, and that includes all the ice, water, and gas water in the planet. And the Earth is special in the sense that it has all three states of matter in a planet. It was the only planet that we know that has that, especially liquid water. And we also have the biosphere, which is the living part of the Earth. Now, some people refer to the biosphere as the whole thing put together, all the spheres combined. And they refer to the living part by itself as the ecosphere. You may also hear the term lithosphere to describe the part of the Earth that's the outer layer of the geosphere, just the top layer of the crust, which is where the life is actually can be found. But either way, interactions between these spheres is what actually makes life on Earth possible. So if you look at, for example, at the carbon cycle, you can see how uh, the life takes oxygen uh, into the air through, uh, puts oxygen into the air through photosynthesis. So that's an interaction between the biosphere and the atmosphere. And backwards, when carbon dioxide is coming from the air into life. So that's another interaction between those two spheres. But life also, as, as it decomposes, becomes part of the soil. That's interacting with the geosphere. More interactions are very easy to see in the water cycle where transpiration between life and the atmosphere, water going to the air, uh, precipitation, water going from the atmosphere to back to the hydrosphere to actually hit the rock and erode it, and that's interacting with the geosphere, right? So there are multiple examples, and I discussed it in more detail in the other video, but these spheres all interact to make things possible. Life depends on the hydrosphere because it's mostly made up of water. It depends on the atmosphere for weather, for the air that it consumes and it makes. It does, does depend on the geosphere. It holds the geosphere in place. The roots of the trees interact with the soil to stop erosion. It also causes erosion because plants and animals break down rock, right, as, as they interact with it. So all of this is a one big system where they all interact with each other. And I did a series of examples on the main video that, that talk about that. If you were interested in uh, practicing, go see that video. On objective two, we talked about the energy sources that power the different cycles and processes that change the earth. So we talked about the fact that most of the energy that, that change, causes geological change to our planet comes from the actual uh, inside of the earth. That's called geothermal energy. Energy, of course, is just the ability to work. Geothermal, it's because it's geo means rock and thermal means heat. So it's the heat energy of the core of the earth. And the core is hot because it used to be hot. It's leftover heat from the formation of, of the earth. And it's also hot because the Earth has gravity squeezing the inner core, uh, making it really, really hot. And because there are radioactive isotopes still in the center of the Earth, slowly decaying, and as they do so, releasing heat. All of these things together cause the Earth to have an energy source that transfers and causes a bunch of processes to happen. We also review the idea of conduction, convection, and radiation. Conduction is energy transfer by touch. Convection is by movement of the hot particles and radiation by light waves like ultra, like uh, infrared radiation. We talked about how this applies to the earth as the core is hot and by conduction warms up the mantle, which moves around by convection, carrying the heat towards the crust, which is then warmed up again by conduction. And then the radiation lets the heat escape through outer space. And that's why the earth is cooling down little by little and eventually went up like Mars and Mercury, which don't really have a uh, much active core anymore. Uh, luckily we have the radioactive, uh, uh, decay still warming us up and our planet is big enough that gravity still makes uh, a difference in heating it up. And um, because it's big, it, it doesn't cool off as fast as other smaller planets do. But the Earth's core is not the only source of energy. We also have energy coming from the sun through the radiation. And that's important because it causes all the weather on the Earth. And it also is what life depends on through that powerful photosynthesis. There are life forms that depend on the heat of the core. They live near volcanic vents and use chemicals coming from the volcanoes. But the majority of life, 99% of it, relies on photosynthesis. So the sun is crucial, especially when you talk about the biosphere. Then we're talking about uh, and the atmosphere because it causes weather. Then we talked about each process and we broke it down in detail, and I'm not going to do that here. But do remember that earthquakes, volcanoes, 
uplift, subsidence, plate tectonics, erosion and weathering, deposition, cementation, compaction, and meteor strikes are all processes that deform the surface of the earth. When earthquakes happen, that sudden release of seismic energy from a rock that was deformed for a very long period of time will crack the surface of the earth. Volcanoes bend the rock upwards, and after they implode, it causes a crater, and they also create new rock as the lava spills and cools down. You have uplift, which is caused by plate tectonics or changes in the weight of the crust, like a new glacier or a new mountain will push down on the crust, causing subsidence. And uh, if, it, if you erode a mountain or a glacier melts, then you're going to get uplift. Uh, both of them can also be caused by plates colliding against each other and bending upwards and downwards. All right, so these are other things that cause changes in the earth. Plate tectonics is the process of the plates moving past each other because of the mental plumes carrying the pieces on top of them. And as they move, they actually cause the bending and, and crashing, which cause volcanoes also, cause earthquakes also, uh, and the uplift and subsidence I talked about before. So it's a huge, important process. Then you have erosion and weathering, which is the breakdown of rock by things like uh, uh, wind and rain and life and rock slides. All of that also causes the uh, changes in the surface of the earth from mountains to sediments. Deposition, cementation, and compaction is when rocks actually get placed together and deposited in a different place where they came from by rain and uh, water and rivers. And then they get squeezed together over thousands of years of one top of each, laying on top of each other and, and, and actually cemented together by chemical deposition of water, putting minerals in between them and gluing them together in any form of sedimentary rock. New new surface of the earth, thanks to this process. Meteor strikes cause uh, craters and, uh, and rocks that change suddenly, like brachia. So you have uh, metamorphic rock caused by meteor strikes. So you have all of these different kinds of things changing the surface of the earth. But each of these things is also caused by a, a type of energy. The majority of the earth first processes, the earthquakes, volcanoes, Uplifts, subsidence, and plate tectonics are based on the heat of the core because a lot of them are essentially based on whether the magma is moving or not underneath it. And of course, because that has to do with gravity, gravity is a part of that too. And gravity also plays a role in uplift because of the weight thing and subsidence. It also plays a role in pulling plate tectonics underneath, uh, doing a, a subduction of plates, right? And of course, making rocks shift to cause earthquakes. And so gravity is also an important source of energy for that. Processes like erosion, deposition, and compaction are primarily caused by weather. And so the sun is the key source of energy there, right? Weather, wind, water evaporating, all of that has to do with the sunlight. But gravity matters too. That's what's going to pull rain downwards. And so it's going to go make the rivers flow towards the ocean. So gravity also matters on that one. And finally, you have um, the meteors, which are caused by the force of gravity, of course, uh, orbits, and just getting unlucky and getting hit by one of those rocks. So these are the processes that change the surface of the earth and the energy behind them. Uh, and then we talked about uh, that these processes cause physical and chemical changes to the earth's surface, which can be best described through the rock cycle. But before I did that, I described what is a physical and chemical change. And of course, physical changes are those that change the material without changing what it actually is. It's still the same chemical identity. And then we have ke uh, chemical changes, which are changes that do change the material, the nature of what it is. New products are formed, bonds are broken, chemical reactions take place. And you see some examples in this page and in this page. Now, we talked about how that applies to the rock cycle, which is the process by which rocks change. We have three main kinds of rocks. You have molten rock that, fall, that cools down to form what's called an igneous rock or volcanic rock. And then you have rocks that form from sediments being deposited, compacted, and cemented together, which is called sedimentary rock. And you have metamorphic rock, which is rock that's formed because other rocks are changed by pressure and heat due to processes like uplift, plate tectonics, uh, sub subsidence, earthquakes, volcanoes, things like that. So when pressure and heat changes rock, you get metamorphic rock. When rock cools down from molten rock, you get igneous rock. And when rock breaks into pieces by erosion and weathering and then gets deposited, cemented, and compacted, you get sedimentary rock. Now, of course... Any kind of rock can also melt back to lava and restart the process, which is why it's called a cycle. Metamorphic rock can also be eroded, and so can igneous rock, and so can sedimentary rock. So the, all these rocks can change into each other. But how do you see physical and chemical changes in these processes? Well, there's many examples of that that I discussed. So, for example, when igneous rocks cool down or melt, so when rocks cool or melt, those are physical changes. The pressure and the heat that causes metamorphic rocks to happen Physical changes. 
uh, the, the squeezing of rock and deposition, or which is moving of pieces and laying on top of each other, it's a physical change. But when the rocks get cemented together or eroded by the acid rain, that's a, that's a chemical change. When erosion happens because of wind or rain bra brazing against the rock and hitting it, that's a physical change, right? And so there are many different examples that I've discussed of how the rock cycle showcases physical and chemical changes. But all of these processes take different amounts of time to take place. By the way, new chemicals are usually coming from volcanoes. The amount of time it takes place depends on the process. Things like earthquakes and meteorite strikes are very quick. They happen suddenly, even if it takes a long, long time to build up to it. Then you have volcanoes, which can last days, months, or years for the actual eruption, even if it takes millions of years, again, to build up to it. Um, the erosion of rocks and the forming of new rocks by deposition, compaction, and cementation can take a very, very, very long time, from hundreds of, uh, to thousands to even millions of years, depending on the size of the rock. And processes like uplift, subsidence, and plate tectonics also can take from hundreds of thousands to millions of years, depending on uh, the situation. If it's a glacier melting or forming, that could be a little quicker. Uh, or a magma plume pushing up or down uh, can be quicker for substance of uplift. But processes like forming entire mountain ranges and entire valleys and entire plateaus because of plates moving past each other over millions and millions of years take a very long time. But in general, you can say that these are the quickest, followed by that, followed by those, and then those. So there's a general idea of that these processes can take longer or shorter periods of time, but in general, it takes a very, very, very long time to change the surface of the earth. And that's an overall review of this content assessment. I hope you find it helpful. If you need more detail, please make sure to watch the other videos where I go into each objective in detail. I hope you found this helpful and don't do anything that wouldn't make a moment proud.